Welcome to Pilgrim Lost. Come walk with us while we explore life in hopeful motion. Welcome to Pilgrim Lost. This is Tony. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, Producer Mark is actually on the Camino as this is as as you're listening to this which is super exciting we're getting feedback from producer mark right now on his experiences on the community de santiago and all that's happening there really proud of him and the transformation that he's going through camino is always is always a phenomenal experience of really doing the work doing the hard work of the internal life um, it's amazing the power of extended meditation when it's when it's rooted in a physical act and Mark is just in the middle of that. And I can't wait till he gets back so I can hear all about just the, the way that his mind and his soul and his inner life has really been formed, has been transformed. I, I mean, thinking back to the communal for myself, I cannot believe, I could not believe at the time, the boxes that my subconscious found inside the attic of my soul and went up and dug through things that I had ignored for years because of the cacophony of life. But in that long uh, sort of meditation and motion, my subconscious just went, hey, let's go dig through some old boxes and, um, and process some stuff. And I, I bet Mark's in the middle of that. And I can't wait to hear about it when he gets back. But for now, everybody, this is this is this is us together. This is just another community time of talking. We've got a lovely guest today that I'm very much looking forward to talking to. But um, between now and then, uh, go to pilgrimlost.com. Stay connected with us. Please follow us at, at @pilgrimlost. And if and if you are willing to support us, go to our Patreon page. Um, but really, this is about you. So stay, keep communicating things that you care about. If there's any topics you want us to talk about? If there's any aspects of pilgriming that you think we haven't gotten to that you're super interested in, I'll go find the guest. I'll go find the expert to talk about it because if you're interested in it, I'm interested in it. So just let us know if there's there's other pilgrimages around the world that you're like, hey, let's let's get somebody on. You know, we talked about the island walk around Prince Edward Island. We talked about the Alpa Adria in Austria and Slovenia. Um, we've been trying to get on some of these other um, pilgrimages. Uh, we talked about the Appalachian Trail a little bit. And um, oh, those are things we really care about. So anyway, keep all those things in mind. Uh, send us notes. But for now, uh, today's guest is Brent Rodriguez Plate. He is a scholar and a writer and a teacher and a professor. And he's coming to us, believe it or not, from Spain. Brent, how are you? Doing great. It's a beautiful day here. It's, uh, it was raining this morning and sunny in the afternoon, which is kind of normal for Spain always get a good bit of sun here. So everything is going well here. Thanks and for having me. Great to see you. And you're actually, you're actually in Madrid right now. I'm in Madrid right now. Yep. Right. Uh, right in the center, uh, right in the center of the city. We spend so much time talking about Spain and then actually have somebody who's physically there. You know, it's like, well, wow, it's, that's beautiful. What are yes. you doing over there? Uh, I'm here. I'm accompanying my partner. She runs the uh, our colleges, Hamilton College's uh, academic program in Spain. Uh, so about every four or five years, she gets on a rotation and comes here and she directs the program. And I take a little leave from my teaching duties and spend my time doing uh, the other things that I do, which is a lot of editing, a lot of writing. And uh, I'm the director of a 501c3. So a lot of a lot of zooming in the afternoons while people back in the U.S. are a few hours behind. I hear you. I spend, I spend too much time on Zoom, honestly. <laughs> and uh, as a writer, I just find that the older I get, I'm in my 50s now, you know, I'm just looking to hide as, as much as possible. Where as a younger man, I was trying to book it my entire day, but now I'm just trying to hide yes. as much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, a good thing to do. And, and it's been sort of nice for me to be able to do here a bit in, in Spain too. I can sort of leave certain parts of the business behind and, uh, and, uh, spend a little time. I usually work, work a bit, uh, in the mornings, do some writing and editing, and then, uh, get time to wander the streets of Madrid, uh, through afternoons oftentimes and discover new cafes and, uh, museums and artworks and things I haven't seen before. It's just, uh, really a pleasure to be able to do this and be here. It's beautiful. I'm super jealous. Um, we, uh, we learned about you, Brent, through your writings. Um, 
particular your book, by the way, which mm -hmm. is which was sort of a reflection travel log on your experience on the community of Santiago. Um, I actually read read it, read part of it, and um, uh, that's sort of how we found you got on our radar. Reached out to you. You're gracious to come on, and um, you you walked the Camino three years ago. Uh, five years ago. So twenty. Let's see, it's 2016. So yeah, January January 1st of 2016, I started out. So just just from a practical standpoint, you started on January 1st. Yeah. Are you yeah. mad? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might if I did it again, I might do it around that time again. You know. Really? Why? It's a totally different experience than what I, I've, I've, having lived here and I've spent some time up in the northern parts and I've, I've been there in the summertime and I've watched like one person after another every five meters walking by, um, which is great, you know, and in the, I'm sure the camaraderie of the whole thing is, is, is wonderful. But um, the wonderful thing about the winter is there were just few, I could walk for half a day and never see another uh, pilgrim along the way. And right. it just had a lot more sort of um quiet time which at the, which at that point in my life was really important to me i did i you know in the evenings i'd meet up with with others in the albergues and in and, and places and the hostels but um and you know plenty of conversation i met plenty of people and walked with them at plenty of times but there were plenty of other days that i just walked on my own and um yeah there's something about the something about the winter that made things really quite nice and and, and luckily i didn't get hit by any big storms or anything in any of the more mountainous areas. So it was actually relatively decent weather uh, through through most of it. So um, yeah, it was a nice, it was a, a nice, nice experience, nice experience. I don't know, nice is a terrible word for such a thing, but <laughs> it was a good experience. And I look back on it fondly. <laughs> Common advice is, you know, mid April is sort of the earliest you want to go. I went, I started on May 1st mm. and, and still found, I mean, I'm a fast walker. So I tended to get in front of the, whatever the, you know, the group leaving every village. I was always in front. I would, I would find half a day without seeing anybody, but man, January, yeah. that sounds yeah. no snow. I mean. Yeah. Luckily not. Uh, yeah. Wow. Both, in the, both in the Pyrenees and uh, over towards the mountains of Leon. Um, get, you know, hit, hit some snow patches here and there, but uh, nothing, nothing really that, uh, I think there was one day that we got some snow and, you know, it was a little muddy uh, because, I mean, there was plenty of mud in, in places, but um, yeah, no, I, I think in a lot of ways just kind of lucked out with the weather. Amazing. Yeah. Nice. Amazing. Um, and, and while you were walking, you were writing by the way. Yeah. So I did a, um, you know, as a, as a writer and always interested in the relations of, of, of writing and walking. I mean, I just, Really intrigued by this uh, this connection between you know journals and journeying and uh, why that's uh, why those are you know etymologically connected as well as on uh, a mm -hmm. physical basis. Like um, so yeah, so I worked on um, yeah, just to, you know as a way to you know I was on Instagram, so I it was a way to kind of keep my friends and family up to date. Every day I would sort of do a post and just sort of say this is. You know, the kind of thing I did, but it turned out it became kind of a good way for me to sit and reflect at the end of the day at the hostels and to, and to sit there and write. Um, so Instagram allows you, it's roughly a 350, 400 word caption you can actually write in Instagram. Right. And so I used Instagram as the basis and, you know, would take, so every, every, it sort of made this challenge to myself. So every day I would take one picture that sort of sum, summarized my day. Then I would write about a 300 word little essay, a couple, three paragraphs, and usually like one quote uh, from rock and roll to uh, philosophers, to theologians. Right, right, right. To linked cool. together and made these little, you know, so it ended up having 30, 32, 33 kind of mini essays, you know, at right. the end and took them, took them from Instagram. And then that became the, you know, basis for the, uh, for the, for the little booklet that you mentioned, uh, by the way, um, which was uh, just sort of fun, you know, I just a, side project, just, just something fun to do. But, uh, you know, I was actually rereading it, uh, not too long ago, actually, uh, after you all uh, contacted me and thought, oh, I should, should try to remember what I, <laughs> what I, what I said back then. And, uh, you know, it was fun to, fun to revisit it and made me think I, I need to, I need to end up, I mean, I could actually drive a couple hours north of here right now and get on the trail for a while. 
Um, but uh, it's a yeah, so good uh, good experience at this uh, at that point in my life, um, and uh, and a uh, you know a, a lifelong interest in well religious ritual, but uh, specifically pilgrimage and travel and walking. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of walker, so. yeah. I um I I went on the Camino four years ago, walked it the Francais starting in Saint Jean, mm-hmm. and before that I was not a walker. Um, I my my background is definitely in spirituality and my my education is in religion, um, but I just had never really practiced that that form of meditation or that form of sort of long form formation, and uh, I went. I don't know if you call it a dare. I went uh, out of the encouragement of a friend of mine named Kari and uh, was scared to death to be alone that much, was scared to death to sort of the, I wasn't sure that there was enough substance inside of me to sustain me through, the, you know, those long days of walking and mm-hmm. a month of basically being alone like you in the evenings I was with people, but during the day I was alone and, um, boy, ever since I went now, I'm one, I'm a walker. And two, I just, like I said, I just look for that silence and I found it really transformative. And as a result, we started this podcast really to use the community of Santiago and other sort of pilgriming metaphors or examples of pilgriming more as a springboard to life. Like how, how is all of life more revealed or um, how, what are, what are the things that we experience these, these inherently human things? Cause everybody who goes seems to have these experiences. It seems like yeah. these inherently human experiences on the community of Santiago or their pilgrimages, um, that, that seem to be universal. And yet you have to spend all this money and take all this time off and get all this, you know, relational privilege from your family to let you go. And mm-hmm. it can't, something this human shouldn't be predicated on privilege. So how do we bring these themes back into our entire life? And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about. And I I just want to jump right in with, can you talk a little bit about sensuality and the sensuality of the experience of the Camino and maybe what you experienced and what you learned from that as far as life is concerned? Yeah, definitely. I've always, you know, I mean, this has been a part of my my academic research as, as well as just and then, of course, I got into the academic research because it just made sense to me and my experiences of life. Um, you know, I sort of went to graduate school and read all this sort of philosophy and theology. And, you know, and, and it just after a while, just got so much of it got so abstract and so sort of seemingly removed from the way so many people were living. Um, even even the stuff that was, you know, m- trying to be. um you know, socially engaged in many ways, and you know, and they're not 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 knocking uh, any of it, but um, it, it still sort of seemed to be disembodied. I guess the word is disembodied. And uh, so, you know, some of my own my own work, my own research was sort of, and I guess it was at odds with what I would would find when I I travel. I've always traveled a lot, and I'd see people, I'd see religious people being devout, doing things. I'd see them lighting candles and smelling things and eating things together. And I see them, um, you know, having visual images as, as part of their, part of their life. And, you know, realize that there's this huge sort of sensual realm of, uh, of people's lives that were um, really making up who they were, you know, and just an everyday basis, not, you know, from, from uh, poor to rich and really around the world, people are, sensually engaged with their surroundings and they sensually engage their religious traditions. Um, and so, so things like uh, pilgrimage, particularly I can, uh, you know, and then sort of doing it oneself, being on it, begin to see the, the, the real physicality. And, you know, so it's, it's one of those things I can, I can talk about forever, but it's not until you do it, right? <laughs> to, right. You really kind of get it and you feel that and, and you feel your body, body changing. And I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's very much about, um, you know, it's not it's not mind over matter. It's matter over mind. You know, it's uh, our our mind is shaped by what our body does. Um, our our thoughts are uh, 
predicated on the kinds of sensual experiences we have and the ways we we taste and touch and see and smell and these kinds of things. Um, so you know, pilgrimage I think brings so many of those things together, and, and you know, just it becomes this very physical experience, and, and the transformation comes. You know, of course, we're we're thinking differently along the way, but but in a sense, we're thinking differently because of our very real physical locations and the and the and the strain. You know, it's a it's a struggle. It's for for many of us in the you know a few few times, especially in the first couple of weeks, my knees started to knees started to give way, and uh, you know, had to take a rest here and there, and um, you know, it becomes a becomes a, a physical endurance as much as uh, so many other things, and it's not and not physical endurance in the you know. Kind of no pain, no gain, kind of you know, rah rah, go get them and get a trainer and uh, kind of thing. But it's uh, became much more, you know, sort of it becomes contemplative. I think through those through those raw physical experiences, right? Um, so I'm so I'm real, you know, I, I I love the kind of sensual dimensions to it. It made me more certainly made me more aware along the way, and you know, I like to think some of it I brought back to my everyday life and uh, became a more aware person in my day-to-day existence. But of course, that meant I had to kind of keep up certain physical practices to make that happen. And uh, and I've always been a walker. I've always, you know, I've always chosen to live in places where I uh, didn't have to drive uh, to work or my, you know, place of employment. I've always chosen to live in places that were, you know, within a couple, couple miles of my office so I could walk there. Um, so that continues to be important to me. Um, so daily basis. There, there's this gift of, you know, again, the privilege of being in these extreme circumstances. When I mean extreme, I just mean separated from life and not having to go to the office and having the freedom to walk, start every day with a five hour walk or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. And in those, and in those circumstances, it, it seems like the stripping away is done to us. Like the, the ability to get in touch with our sensuality to become raw to become exposed is done to us as we walk as we literally our our bodies break down by the experience our minds go through the process of slowing and stilling our souls slow and still and suddenly it seems like the nerve endings of our soul as well as our physical self become exposed and become raw and suddenly the trees are more beautiful the the sound of the birds is more startling the the ring of the bell in the church tower is is more inspiring the you know going to the pilgrim mass in the afternoon and i'm not catholic but i would go to the pilgrim mass whenever i could and and the the imagery and my spanish is terrible so i don't even understand what was going on half the time and yet i was still caught up in the beauty of it because it felt like these nerve endings had been exposed by this, had been, you know, that the, that the false, that the calluses mm-hmm. of life had been stripped off by the experience. Does that make a sense? Am I connecting yeah. with what you're saying? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I like that. There's sort of a, a stripping away of, uh, of things and um, more, more, you know, literally in touch and, you know, I want to maybe come right. to talking about, you know, using the way we use metaphors and um, how that is both, uh, I think, sometimes a, obviously a huge help, but also a hindrance at times because uh, we, use, we use the language of metaphor, but it actually removes us from the actual thing, you know? So I, I wanna, let, let's keep in touch, right? We use that language and, um, you know, let's keep in touch. And it, and it might mean I'm gonna text you every once in a while. And that's not the same thing as giving someone a hug. Um, right. You know, so in touch there just becomes a metaphor of some words that I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to keep in touch by sending you some words on a text sometimes, right? Um, which is, you know, that's a very, very different thing. So I, I think that I, I like that, you know, that idea of sort of rub, you know, sort of rubs some of the, um, some of the stuff away and it makes it more of a, you know, more able to be in touch uh, along the way. And, and the, yeah. And, and, and yeah, of course, pilgrimage um, does that and in being out, you know, and in, in, in all kinds of ways, not just the Camino, but uh, you know, being on the, um, you know, people on the Appalachian Trail or Pacific Crest Trail or, you know, some of these other long walkthroughs, you know, are, are like that, too. And you just you're sort of partly it's that you're, you know, the experience, right, of just 
everything I need is on my back. You know, it's just right there. And yeah, make sure obviously aware of what you're what you're carrying with you, but it just it strips you sort of strips you down to just the the bare necessities. Um, and that's uh, you know can be a can be a hugely important thing uh, to to realize to realize on one hand how little we need you know in our sort of consumerist consumerist culture it's yeah. uh, important to kind of realize that a lot of the stuff is superfluous yeah. and I really don't need that and this and those other things yeah it, and I find that again part of the privilege of the Camino or those sorts of experiences is that those, those stripping experiences happen to me. I kind of, I kind of can't avoid it. You know, it's sort of, you're, you sort of are stuck. You're stuck in the middle of, you know, the Meseta and you're just like, I'm stuck in the middle of this and it's being done to me yeah, living right. here in Portland, Oregon. Um, I don't, it's, you know, there, there are rare opportunities that I get to go on a five hour walk or I get to leave the city and sort of leave the world behind and let that stripping be done to me here. If I walk for half an hour, an hour, two hours, whatever I can make happen within a day, I find that I have to sort of do the, do the stripping more ceremonially mm. than, than just sort of waiting passively for it to happen. Mm. So, you know, I might, I might step out on the road and I might go and hang my hang my toes off the curb in front of my house and go, I'm leaving behind the worries of every day. And then I'll walk and I'll say, you know, I, I'm leaving behind my work. Mm -hmm. And for the next hour and a half, it's not about my work. I'm leaving behind my fears about money or success or whatever the thing is I might be I might be aware of it. I'm, I'm going to strip myself of that because right now I, I just want I want those nerve endings to become raw. I want to strip that away in this experience. But I do find I have to be a lot more intentional or ceremonial yeah. about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 definitely. So there's sort of there's the the discipline, the discipline aspect, right? Uh, to, these become you know spiritual disciplines, and you know all the great religious traditions have this sort of very, you know regimented kind of way in which these, right. these disciplines happen do this right. this way you know um you know put your body in this way uh right these, these are all kind of key things and it, and it gets us you know again it gets us in the mindset of of it i mean i you know, love sort of zen buddhism as a as such a great example you know yeah. sort of read about it or hear about it. it's like oh you Think about nothing. It's just about emptying your mind. But you can't empty your mind unless you put your body in very specific places, very specific times. Usually, you hear a you know, most places they'll bang a gong or a bell or something to start the session. You've got this hearing. Maybe some incense will be going around. Uh, other parts of it, there's it's a chanting, uh, chanting right. meditation. There's walking meditations as part of Zen Zen tradition as well. So it's it's. Maybe ultimately it's about clearing the mind, but you've got to do all these bodily things to get there. There's no such thing as as a non-sensual religion. You know, <laughs> ultimately there's no such thing as a, just a thinking religion. And it, right. it, you've got to get up consciously get there. But it's you know, I, I you said you put your toes on the curb. You know, and there's sort of those yeah. positions we get into, and yeah. I do I do certain things. You know, it's um, you know just even trying to be mindful about how I might put my jacket on and walking out the door and, yeah. and you know, being, uh, you know, mindful of these things, but it's not just mind. It's, it's my body moving that gets my mind going. And then my mind kind of works and then my body, you know, it's back, it's putting the mind and the body together ultimately yeah. is, the, is the goal. Um, so yeah, the con the consciousness of it, um, and working, you know, being, being free to let ourselves, I think, I think, I don't know. For for me, I grew up in this kind of Protestant tradition that was suspicious. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, go, 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 let's <laughs> talk about that. It's something sensual, you know. Oh, that's for those Catholics and all those other people. Right. You know, we just we just think the right things and everything's going to be okay. And and you know, it's just BS. I mean, Protestants are some of the most you know physical people I've met. They just don't want to pretend they are. You know, I, and I right myself in this. You know, um, you know. No, we don't like objects. Just don't take my Bible away from me or where the preacher stands up and waves his Bible right. at you. And you're thinking, Oh, right. that's not an object I'm looking at. <laughs> right. Um, right. So the, you know, very, very physical kind of things. Churches are created in very specific kinds of ways. You know, the architecture of, you know, these places, uh, even the, the so-called emerging churches, you know, are, are, 
often, you know, there's a there's an architecture to them. They're kits. You buy kits for how you're going to do this. And mm. you know, there's a very physical way that you you do these things, um, which is which is great. I mean, it's it's what we what we humans do. But but then, you know, acknowledge that. You know, I guess part of what I'm trying to you know get at with my students and classes and my writing is just simple acknowledgements that hey this world is amazing you know there's things to smell and to touch and to and to taste and to, and to look at and we we can and there you know it's there's there's a lot of wonder in this world um and um it's just let's just you know be aware of that and let that be a you know let that be a good thing let, let's find some let's continue to get back to wonder and for, for me wonder is kind of reviving the, the, the kind of not just the natural world, because I think it can happen in the middle of a city as well, and middle of uh, you know anywhere there's people and um, right. things like that. So, yeah. yeah, I was. I mean, I was sort of raised in you know classical Western dualism, both yeah. culturally and religiously, where the body and the mind are separate from one another, and the body, our physicality, is sort of best case scenar scenarios. You know, a utilitarian meat suit. That, that is sort of a necessary evil to enact life. Yeah. And right. at its worst, it's the thing that stands against us. It's the, yeah. you know, in, in my religious tradition, the flesh is the thing that, that I'm, that I'm yeah. trying to destroy. I'm trying to beat down. And yet in reality, or maybe I'll just ask you, like, how would you want to reframe that thinking as opposed to me talking? Cause I'm more interested in your thoughts. <laughs> um yeah no i mean i you know take you know do something with that that meat suit you know i mean i think those are the, the flesh is really really critical i you know I, plenty of uh you know i guess there's some biblical verses to sort of people sort of throw at you to back it up but uh the, the bible itself i think is pretty full with uh, pretty sensual sensual kinds of uh things that are that are going on throughout it and um so I think, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think there's, uh, it's been, yeah, there've been some sort of abuses with, with some of the, some of that, that, that I think gets us this sort of dualistic, ends us, ends up in this dualistic way of thinking that our somehow our mind and body are separate, that somehow the body is suspect and the mind and the sort of spirit or soul or however, you know, what kind of language we want to use is somehow that's what's going to go on to this afterlife. And that's the kind of pure thing. Um, but I, you know, I'm, suspicious, <laughs> suspicious of, of, of those kinds of dualisms. And I think, you know, working to bring those back together, because I, I think it, 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 beyond the theology, I think it just doesn't make sense. Um, I mean, I think this is what, you know, I've sort of written a little bit about this here and there, you know, so as, as I sort of hit midlife. Um, I feel like part of, part of the, you know, talk about is midlife crises. Uh, I think part of it is, is we've gotten to a point where our mind and our body are pulled apart and we live these sort of dual lives and the crisis is instigated because we're just, it's not sustainable to have, uh, to keep denying the body and just sort of think, I can just sort of think, think my way through this. Right. Uh, uh, and simultaneously with this is the fascinating uh, this is probably a whole nother conversation we might have to do another episode but or just you and i hang out sometime uh, yeah. i'll be in spain in september maybe i'll i'll come visit you um but simultaneously it's at the time when our body is breaking down we are yes. no longer gods it's the same time when we're i am no longer a god i am no longer able to like make my body jump high and run fast and that simultaneously it's in that moment of deconstructing our power yeah. Yeah. that we actually embrace our body, which is, right. you know, so human that it would yeah. happen in that paradoxical experience. Yeah. 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 No, I think, I think that's, I think that's true. I think that's really, really kind of key. My, my, uh, my brother is a um, uh, couple years younger than me. He was a big uh, volleyball player for a lot of his life, played a lot and uh, in the beaches of Southern California and things like that. And yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I, played, yeah. I played ball in college. Oh yeah. Nice. Sure. Yeah. This is my, dude, um, now you're talking my language. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was, I was, uh, you know, I played a lot when I was younger too. And he, you know, but he played it regularly and with some friends. And at a certain point when he turned, I don't know, I think they were in the mid forties at some point. Um, I think he and some friends went out and tried to play 
And it was just, you know, everybody's just aching and just like they, they hadn't done it for a while. It's yeah. like, oh, this is too much. You know, they really kind of realize they're going to hurt themselves. And so they got together at some pub and just had this little ritual and said, well, that was our volleyball life. And now we're right. moving on and, and did this sort of acknowledgement, of it, which I thought right. was pretty cool, uh, you know, uh, kind of thing to do. And just just, you know, so part of it, of course, is realizing our limitations of what we what we can and can't do. Um, and, you know, luckily walking is one of those things if, if uh, at certain points in our life, um, Good. it becomes, you know, more difficult or, you know, certain abilities or disabilities make this more difficult. Um, but it's very, you know, we, we, we evolve for, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty clear from archeological <laughs> records that uh, we evolve to walk, you know, we humans to, to walk on, that's why our, anatomy is basically the way it is is because we evolved to walk on two feet and mm. walking was a huge part of why we became the kind of homo sapien creatures that we are today um actually to sus suspect that part of our, our you know sort of larger brain size even is is related to our abilities to walk you know walking came before the large brains and that sort of you know physicality begins before our thinking abilities do so i think there's um you know walk, walking is uh you know you can take take with you in many places uh and then when i travel that's always what i do I get to a new city just start walking <laughs> see right. what i can find yeah yeah me too uh, me too yeah. i lived in europe for um, my 20s and yeah. I, I couldn't wait to go to a new city and just, just disappear disappear yeah. into the streets and yeah. find all right i would I I feel like my mind's just going like six different directions, but uh, let me get your take on this because this is this is something that I think is fascinating about the Camino, the experience of the Camino, that applies to this dialogue we're having. The Camino de Santiago, even more so than the Pacific Crest Trail, which is here on the West Coast, is this incredibly meaningful experience for people. It's hard to explain, and yet. <laughs> It does not exist apart from religious history. Like mm -hmm. you're 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 going to a cathedral where the bones of St. James are buried. That's why people did it. That's why they were told to do it by their monk or their bishop or whoever sent them on this pilgrimage, sometimes out of you know religious discipline and sometimes out of inspiration, but they were sent on this trip. The trip is full. I mean, you're you're walking in the footsteps of millions of religious pilgrims throughout history. There's the sound of the church bells. There's the church mm. at the end of every day. There's a church at the end of the walk. There's singing nuns in the middle of it. You know, there's all these things going on. And yet the vast majority of people who do it are non-religious. Yeah. The vast yeah. majority of people I met were non-religious. And they spoke as if it was as meaningful as the religious people I came yeah. across. Explain that to me. <laughs> Why aren't they on the Appalachian Trail? Why are they on the community of Santiago? Explain this to me. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think, I think it's, you know, I think these kind of things like pilgrimage, I think we find it across religious traditions because it because it's something that works within human life. You know, it takes this very natural ability of Homo sapiens anatomy as we've evolved and it turns it into a special kind of walking. You know, it's not just any walking, it's a special kind of walking. So we, we find it in, in Buddhism and, and Islam and uh, Hinduism and, and Christianity. We find these, these pilgrimages, you know, this is a special kind of walking that people are doing. And, and it seems to date back for, you know, literally thousands and, and even, you know, up to 10, you know, we're, we're finding archeological evidence that 10,000 years ago, there were these great pilgrimage cities in various parts of the world. And, People didn't necessarily live there, but these became the sort of places people would make a pilgrimage to. So it's it's deep. It's it's in our literally in our DNA to to take these walks, you know, to take these kinds of journeys. Um, you know why why they ended up. You know why would you not do the Appalachian Trail? Why would you do the Camino? I, I, you know, I don't know. There's probably a lot of a lot of answers to that. I mean, partly when I when I was there, um, the it was uh, in January is the college break in Korea. And uh, it's become a big, the pilgrimage, uh, com the Camino has become a big thing for Koreans. Uh, yeah. They had um, 
Paulo Coelho's book was translated into Korea, Korean some years ago, and a, a journalist from Korea went and did the Camino 10, 15 years ago and wrote a book about it, and they did some specials on TV. And so now it's become a huge kind of industry. They've, they've actually got a Camino in Korea, someone established a few years ago, sort of a um, literally in, you know, in a, even the language about it is indebted to the Camino de Santiago, but they've sort of transported the idea to uh, to Korea. You can actually walk the Korean Camino now. Really? Um, Do you know where that is? Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I could, I could, I, I don't know exactly yeah, let's you and I work together yeah. to look it up. Like if there's yeah. a website about it or information about it, we'll maybe put that in the show notes because, you know, we're always yeah. trying to let people know you don't have to go to Spain. Spain's yeah, right. getting crowded. Right. There's other choices. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, this is one of those. And, you know, I, I walked and talked with a lot of the, the Koreans. So it, it's um <clears throat> it's their uh, big college break in the month of January. They typically don't have university classes. So uh, most of the people I walked with were Korean. Um, and, and Korean college students who had flown, you know, all the way from Korea to uh, to Madrid or, or wherever, and uh, you know, started on the, on the Camino and did that. Um, and it became a variety of things. Some of them, it it clearly became a, you know, the people I experienced that was uh, it was a chance to meet a significant other. Um, it was a lot of that going on. Uh, hey, you're here too, so we should get together and talk, you know, about these things. Um, there was, you know, I met, I met Buddhists, I met Christians, uh, both Catholic and Protestant. Uh, and then a lot of, you know, people who were, you know, uh, Koreans who were, you know, basically atheistic or agnostic. And, um, you know, so it had the whole, whole sort of gamut of, of things. <clears throat> and I, I, and I, I asked one of the, um, I think I wrote about this a little in my, in my little booklet, uh, but I asked one of them, I said, you know, the, the question is, why are you walking, right? You, Sort of this is this is how you meet other people, right? You say something and then say, "Why are you walking?" And, and you get their ideas. And uh, so I asked one of them, you know, why why are there so many Koreans here walking? And uh, they 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 told me they said, "I think Koreans like to do things that are difficult." Um, <laughs> and so just staying in Korea and doing a walk wouldn't be enough. They need to fly halfway around the world and right. do it. That, that was that was that was their answer to to my questions. Koreans like right. to do things that are difficult. Um, so I think, I think there's, you know, I think the difficulty is is part of it. It's, uh, you know, you travel to some other part of the world to do it. Um, it, it, it is difficult, you know, even, even for people in shape, it's uh, it's tough to do. <clears throat> and I, I think it's, um, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it'd be hard to compare, you know, what, I mean, there's how many tens of thousands of people doing, you know, the, the PCT and the Appalachian Trail every year as well. Uh, so certainly some people are choosing to do those things uh, instead. Um, yeah. I think the, I think the Camino has a certain kind of a appeal. I think it's its long history to it. You know, the idea that <clears throat> you're walking on this place that, you know, li literally millions of people have walked for, right. you know, over a thousand years. Right. Um, and that's that's pretty that's. Yeah. And it's a, it's a counter narrative that I think the human soul needs. We, you know, yeah. we, we, we live in a world that is 15 minutes old all the time. You know, mm -hmm. most of my contemporaries don't really have a relationship with their grandparents, let alone their great grandparents. You know, mm -hmm. we live in this hyper localized yet online disembodied experience. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my home is a hundred years old and my home's considered old for right. Oregon. You know, we're just yeah. not, we're not in, of these old stories, we're not connected to them. And when and when you're raised non-religious, you know, religion provides an old story to be a part of. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a part of this thing. I get to go and I get to walk in this old story. I get yeah. to yeah. add add my verse to this old poem and be a part mm -hmm. of the poem. And I get to sing harmony with this melody line as I as I yeah. go along the walk. Yeah. And um, so yeah, it's a beautiful way to put that. Yeah. And, um, and also we live in a world devoid. It's, it's connected to the old, but devoid of, of real symbols of real meaningful rooted sort of, um, uh, symbols that have been vetted 
by time and, and multiple cultures, you know, mm. uh, the, the sort of, the sort of symbols that we cling to now, you know, a lightsaber is a great symbol, but it's, it hasn't been vetted by, you know, a hundred generations over a thousand cultures. It hasn't been vetted that way, the way that something like the Camino and those old structures and those old symbols and the place you place your hand as you enter the cathedral and all those sorts of things are like, this has been meaningful for a lot yeah. of people. And I get to, it gets to be meaningful for me. You know, yeah. I get to do that as well. And um, there's a, I think there is a hunger. There's a, there's an unsatiated whole part of the human experience that regardless whether you're religion, re religious, or whether you even think religion is important, you might think it's dumb, right. but you still right. want to tap into the old, the, the right. these larger narratives. That's some of my thinking on it at least. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's right. Um, yeah. We, we, yeah, we, we, we do. We long for these, um, long for these experiences and connections, right? I mean, I think right. So disconnected. Um, it's like there's a little echo. I don't know if you hear, are you hearing the echo? Nope. You're coming right clear for me. Okay. okay. A little echo on my end. Um, but yeah, we, you know, I, I think our hyper individualized life, especially in the United States, I'm finding it's quite different here in Spain, but um, right. in, in the U.S. with uh, sort of uh, consumer capitalism and sort of right. telling us we're all, you know, we're all number one and we've all making our own choices on everything. Right. Um, gives us this uh, this sense of, I mean, kind of a false sense of freedom, but a uh, sense of yeah. uh, freedom that I, I'm 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 the master of my own space, and I'm the, I'm the one who does all this. Um, and of course, you know, again, we're not, you know, we were not meant to be alone. Um, and you know, it's just the kind of consequences of, of, of so much disconnection in our life that uh, we start to, you know, crave these crave these points where we find the connection again um so yeah i think the you know there's all kinds of ways this happens but uh, of course the, the camino or some sort of meaningful experience like that i think does do that and you know significant that it's you know i, I wrote a bit about this in uh back in the day but uh, on the camino it's it's fairly hard to get lost you know i mean there's so many markers along the right. way I mean, you can barely go for more than half a kilometer without seeing that yellow, you know, arrow somewhere right. along the way. I mean, you really, I, I met people who, you know, the, <laughs> this guy is this sort of genius software engineer from Silicon Valley and it just quit his job and he was going on this and uh, his, his wife made sure he kept this little GPS tracker on his, he kept it, you know, right on his uh, shoulder the whole time, you know, but make sure he didn't, didn't lose his way uh, along the way. And, right. um, you know, I, I, it's, it's like, I you can't really, it'd be, be pretty hard to kind of get too lost. I mean, there's a few, few places that are tougher than others. Right. But, um, but there's something about that too, right? You're, you're going in the same path. It's not, you're not forging your own trail. You're not doing your own thing. You're not, uh, you know, you're not Lewis and Clark or whoever kind of right. um, people are there. You're, you know, you're really, you're, you're following in the footsteps of many other people. Um, and so it's not about doing something brand new. It's about um, being in the same path as, as all the other people. And yeah, I like that, that sense of that harmony and melody that you were talking about, you know, right. in, that, in that kind of way. Yeah, and that's part of the gift of it, honestly, is that decision-making is removed from the yeah. menu of things you have to deal with yes. all day long. Right. Like that whole yeah. column of the menu is gone. So now I get to just focus on this column over here, you know, which is just the vegetables. I don't have to worry about, you know, all this other stuff because <laughs> I don't have to think about how I'm going to get there. And, you know, for me, the, the, I, because I would get to towns fairly early because I was walking quickly, um, I just go to the first albergue I saw, I'll walk in, and the process of figuring out where I was going to sleep and eat that right. night was a 10 minute process. And then yeah. I was just, yeah, exactly. my day was back to mine again, you know, to read and think and do whatever. Yeah. 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 I, do, I do just want to want to point out that, that part of the reason why it's so much fun and it's so powerful to talk about the Camino as an example of these things um, is because we long for them, but you don't have to go to Spain to experience them. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that, that the, that the birds sound beautiful and the trees are gorgeous and the roads are inspiring. And there are these narratives I get to be a part of. That's just as true in Portland. I've just, I have just falsely embraced the narrative that that's that it's not here. It's, it's, it's in other places. Wow. And if I can, if, if I can just 
wake up. If I can be born again, to use a religious term, to this reality that the trees in, in Portland, Oregon are actually pretty damn beautiful. Right. Those are the flowers and the birds are amazing and the the people are amazing. And there's there's just as many narratives for me to interconnect with. And there are there are these these intersection of stories that I can connect with. Um, so and, and it's just the question is, am I open to it? Or am I spending my life just waiting, which is a lot, a lot of our community is waiting to go on the Camino. You know, it's all going to make sense when I go on the Camino, you know, or when I do this thing. And yet, is that, is that really what, what yeah. it means to be human? Yeah, right. Well, I think it does, you know, I think there is something to the, you know, being able to take that time, that devoted time. And, and it, and it does you know, like any, any routine, right, that you would get into, you have to sort of um, spend a, a significant amount of time doing it, you know, I mean, there's these different, different kinds of uh, sayings and, you know, sort of uh, recovery communities and things like that, you know, where it yes. takes this many days to break a Good habit, you know, get out of this, and needs this many. Hit. And so there's something about the habit of it, you know, instilling a habit of it. It's, I think, I think it is difficult to just wake up, and say, oh, you know, whether it's January 1st or it's a Monday and you say, this is the week I'm going to start exercising, right? I haven't really done anything before, but I'm just going to start. That's bound to fail. Usually um, it needs some sort of, you know, almost like a kickstart or a jump start. You know, you need, uh, you need retreat. And, you know, this is why spiritual retreats are, are you know, important sort of in different, but, but similar kinds of ways. It's important to go off for, you know, a, a few days and take a retreat and just really be focused on whatever it is, prayer or meditation or whatever tradition you're sort of doing it in. And then you're sort of able to bring back these energies and it helps you do, do your daily, but it's almost like we run out of, um, you know, run out. And what you, you know, again, this is why religious traditions have built in these, you know, Lent is 40 days long, right? Or Advent, it's for, you know, four weeks within the Christian tradition. They're, they're long periods of time uh, leading up to significant events. It's not just a day of Lent. I'm just going to think about this, you know, right. it's, for, you know, 40 days. That's a, that's a good chunk of a year right. uh, on the sort of traditional calendar. Can't we forget about all these things in our modern life? But um you know, or, or Ramadan, uh, you know, you do, it's a whole month of, of fasting during the right. day um, or, you know, make the, the pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, do the Hajj and you do it once in your lifetime, right? That's, that was the idea or that's the idea within Islam. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I, I think these things are built again, built into our religious traditions, but we, you know, sort of steamroll over them, you know, what's, you know, Ash Wednesday. Okay. I'll go. I'll remember this. I'll get the ash in my forehead and then, you know, kind of forget about it until Holy Week comes and you know, something like that. Um, but I think we need these, I think it's important to have these long chunks of time. I, I know it, it sounds like uh, privilege in certain ways, but it's, it's about also making the time, you know, people, it, it's not, there, there's okay. You know, and again, you don't have to go to Spain. You don't have to go to the Santiago. You can do it in all kinds of different ways, but finding being plugged into something that's going to challenge us to take some time to do this, you know, to, to, you know, take this Sabbath, take this sort of time apart from our everyday life. And, you know, only by sort of really fully removing ourselves, can we kind of rebuild uh, our lives. And I think it, it, it takes time. It takes effort it takes some energy. Uh, to do that. And, and there's different, different ways that can be done. Um, they don't all require money. They don't all require, you know, huge resources. There are uh, a lot of things are fairly, fairly simple to, to do. I just have, I just have a couple more questions yeah. for you and then, you know, we can wrap this up, but um, I've enjoyed this conversation very, very much. You, you've, you're very interesting. I, I wish we lived closer to each other so we could uh, actually hang out and, <laughs> go for a walk. Um, go for a walk. Yeah, uh, I'm just curious. You know, we've 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 existed in the area of ideas a little bit on this, and I just wanted to give you a chance. Is there anything sort of sort of tender in this this season of your pilgrimage? You've talked about middle age. You've talked about some different things that you're sort of processing right now. That's that's just just going on that, that you'd be willing to share. <laughs> Oh gosh. Yeah. You know, I, I think 
like so many people, COVID kind of hit and, uh, you know, shook a lot of things up, um, sort of things settled that I didn't realize were, were there before. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think a few, few issues. I mean, my, you know, my kids are, um, teenagers now, one of them's yeah. you know, a year from now will be heading off to, you know, out of the house some, somehow or another. Um, you know, so it's this, you know, very transitional time. I feel like for me, I'm, uh, my, my partner and I are starting to look at, uh, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we're, we're not going to stay at, uh, we're not going to be academics for the rest of our lives, you know, well, another 10 years. I hopefully keep writing, keep doing some sort of education, but, you know, we're really kind of very consciously thinking, okay, 10 years from now, our kids will be through college. Um, we're going to be ready in our early mid sixties, ready to be done with a lot of this. So, what the hell do we do? <laughs> and it feels, you know, partly it's exciting, but partly it's this, you know, the, and, and again, COVID sort of, I think, kind of pushed a lot of those issues for us, yeah. with many people. And it, it really kind of, it, it really messed with my mind in this past year. It was really, I, you know, honestly, I had a pretty, pretty tough year and, and some kind of mental, mental health issues and some mm. sort of depression, depression that I've sort of struggled mm. with all off through my life, uh, sort of came back and, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a kind of a struggle of a, of a year for me. I, it's, mm. I, and I, and I, you know, it's one of those things where you, on the surface, I'm like, Hey, I'm in Madrid. I'm not teaching this year. I do some work during the day. I go for a walk in Madrid and that, that is, it's great. But there's, you know, there's also sort of a inner turmoil going on, um, sort of reading, reading all these essays, you know, about how mental health, uh, issues have been on the increase with COVID. And I, Mm. Started reading those two years ago, thinking, "Oh, I, that's terrible that this is happening." And then mm. I'm all into it, I'm like, "Wait a minute, that's that's me. <laughs> I'm this is this is happening to me too." Mm. Um, so you know, we're working working through those things, thinking, and I, and I I don't know. It, it's funny too. I I think I need to. I think I need a, <laughs> and, and and this 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 is kind of an interesting thing I've thought about. I don't know what 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 you've thought about this, but every once in a while. I, and, and on the Camino, I met people who have done it multiple times. You know, I met this met this Italian lawyer who seems to have this kind of wild life, he goes to Italy and he lives his life and he plays hard. And then he just kind of seems to crash. I mean, I was, I was picking up on his stories and then he's sort of like, I need to go on the Camino. And he goes and takes a month off of everything, quits his job, goes on the Camino, you know, goes back, gets into a relationship, crashes the relationship goes on the Camino and it's sort of like a, like a fixer thing for him. And I, and I met several people who are just like, I need to go back to the Camino. And part of me has been tempted, especially as I've been here in Spain this year, to sort of think I should go back and do the Camino. Maybe it would fix me. Um, and I've kind of resisted that too, huh. because I don't, and maybe it would, maybe it would be great. I it, partly, we actually right now don't have the ability for me just to take off for a month and, you know, have my kids, here at home and my, my, my partner working full time. But, um, but I, I, I guess I sort of want to push against the idea that it can fix something, right? I, right. I did it before and it had a tremendous impact on my life and I changed a lot of how I see things. Um, but I don't want to make it a fixer thing. I don't, um, I don't know. So I, so I'm not, I think that's part of the thing. I'm wondering how do I find how do we get fixed uh, without something like that? You know, how do I, but it, but again, it feels like I can't just wake up on Monday and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start this thing. Hmm. You know, significant break. I don't know. That's, that's what that's I'm great. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Any last thoughts, anything else you want us to know about you or want our community to know before we say goodbye? Well, no, I really appreciate the the work, the couple of sessions, the podcast I've heard uh, you all do. I think these are it's a great, a great uh, project, and uh, and hopefully, I mean, you know, I think the the metaphor of it all, and it's I, I always want to sort of play with the metaphors. The metaphors are important, but of course, to be to be a pilgrim lost is different than to literally be lost in the middle of nowhere, not where you know where you are. Right. You know, there's right. a spiritual lostness, there's a physical lostness, and right. sometimes those are related. But um, also, I think there's, you know, again, uh, back to what we were talking about earlier, the importance of this kind of physical experience that it's, you know, physical really shapes the mental, the emotional, the spiritual. 
part of ourselves and it's not necessarily the other. I, I, I think they're best in dialogue with each other. Right. Um, but I think it's important to oftentimes start with the physical. We, I need to change my location. I need to change where I am, who I am, how I am. And, and I mean that very physically. Um, and then sometimes the spiritual, the emotional, psychological will follow along after that physical changes. So, you know, don't pretend the body is a bag of bones. It's uh, That's great. <laughs> That's great. Important thing. So yeah, and we're we're using lost very much in that Tolkien, not all who wander are lost, and yeah, this yeah. is a place yeah. for those who wander and wonder. And yeah, um, but there is a there is a sense of um, sadness and deprivation of this twenty first century mm. version mm. of humanity that we have we have been force fed, and in some ways wanting to stand against that. Yeah. wanting to oh, right. believe more you know yeah. that there there's that wholeness is not something to just dismiss and it's and wholeness is not about being entertained more it's not about um the yeah. tastes and the filling our gut and getting our you know all of our desires met that there is something deeper to being human and um, you've helped us process that today and I've really appreciated yeah. it. Uh, you've been great. Uh, yeah. everybody that's, that's Brent Rodriguez played. Did you have another thought there, sir? No, no, no. All good. And, uh, you can go to his website. There it is on, and, um, www.sbrentplate like dish.net. And, um, you learn about his writings, his teachings and his books. You've written quite a bit on cinema. And spirituality, mm -hmm. yeah. which is one yeah. of my sort of hobby things. So that might be a whole yeah. other conversation at some point. Yeah. Anybody who knows me, I'm, um, I'm first of all, I'm very theatrical, just overwhelmingly so. But um, seeing, processing meaning and how meaning manifests itself in narratives and as basically a storyteller is my career is what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, narratives are really important to me. So that's a whole nother thing I'd like to talk to you about at some point. Hey, are you going to be in Madrid in November? Uh, no, I'll be back in the, back in the States and we're moving back this summer in July. Yeah. I fly yeah. out of Madrid on like November 2nd, I think after oh, okay. I walk, you know, and I was like, Oh, you could take yeah. me out for top off. Exactly. <laughs> Would have been fun. Uh, all right. Um, thank you so much. And, uh, as we say here, thanks for getting lost with us Absolutely. and to the entire community, you guys, thanks for being here. Please continue to respond to these thoughts. Is there anything that Brent said that you found interesting? Let us know. Or I should say, how many things that he said that you found interesting, let us know. And um, keep looking for us every first and third Tuesday of the month. And this is Pilgrim Lost. That's Brent. Thanks so much, buddy. And uh, take care, everyone. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, everybody.